Shalom TV, celebrating Jewish culture. Funding for Shalom TV has been provided by the following and by viewers like you. On June 5th of this year, on his way to Normandy to commemorate the 65th anniversary of D-Day, the Allied invasion of Europe, President Barack Obama stopped at the German death camp of Buchenwald. The President was accompanied by German Chancellor Angela Merkel, by Bertrand Herz, the President of an association of Buchenwald survivors, and he was accompanied by Elie Wiesel, the Nobel Peace Laureate and the symbol for the Jewish community and indeed the entire world of the meaning of life after the Shoah, the Holocaust. There are few people on the world stage with the stature and the eloquence of Elie Wiesel, who is passionate in his utter contempt for any form of inhumanity, cruelty, inflicted on any people on this earth. He may well be the conscience of Western civilization. A sense of security for Israel. A sense of security for its neighbors to bring peace in that place. The time has come, it's enough. Enough to go to cemeteries. Enough to weep for orphans, it's enough. There must come a moment. A moment of bringing people together. And of course, many of you may be familiar with Elie Wiesel for one of more than 50 of his works of fiction and non-fiction, beginning with Night, a memoir of his experiences as a young teenager caught in the brutality and inhumanity of Buchenwald itself, the very camp to which Ellie and his father were taken from their home in Siget, Transylvania, and the place where Elie Wiesel's father would die. Ellie's latest novel is a moving story of a spiritual survival and love and the transcendence of the human spirit entitled A Mad Desire to Dance, published by Knopf Press. It's a beautiful, wonderful book. I hope many of you will take the opportunity to read it. And for me personally, Elie Wiesel's had a profound and powerful impact on my life, as he's had on so many of those fortunate enough to have crossed his path. From the moment I first heard him present Midrash to the great stories of Genesis, which you now can all read in his spectacular book of Midrash entitled Messengers of God. To a series of many interviews I had the chance to do with him, first on radio, then on television. And I always found his insights and approach to life and love of the Jewish tradition and the state of Israel always to be inspiring in myriad ways. I love him very much and he has been very kind to me throughout my entire broadcasting career. And so when Elie Wiesel returned from Buchenwald and his visit there with the President of the United States, he was gracious enough to come join us to talk about his visit, about his latest novel, A Mad Desire to Dance, and about his worldview now. Here then is my conversation with Elie Wiesel. You know how much I appreciate your taking time and coming over the bridge and giving me some of your wisdom and insight. You are as busy as ever. Busier. Busier. We saw, obviously, that you and President Obama visited Buchenwald, which was where you were with your father during the Holocaust. And you mention in the remarks you make when it's your turn to speak about the fact that you lost your father there. You speak about it in such a moving, and maybe this is the inappropriate word, but it's revealing, it is so revealing. And you know how much I treasure night. But there were, in your words at Buchenwald, something extraordinary about how you reflected on the pain of your father's passing, and that in some way, going to Buchenwald with President Obama was going back in some way to see your father. So before I ask you, you know, the politics of it all, 
Ellie, what was it like for you inside to walk through the camp and to remember the things you had to remember and then to remember the death of your father? Mark, on one level it was unreal. I saw myself then and all of a sudden I am there with the President of the United States coming in his plane, in his helicopter, in his car to Buchenwald. But the, 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 the real thing is that Buchenwald today is not what it used to be, not only because of the, of the uh, physical uh, appearances. Buchenwald to me was what was called the little camp. The little camp. Buchenwald was actually a concentration camp. It was not an extermination camp. It was created in the 1930s, mid-30s, for the, uh, or against all those who were, who were not Nazis, who were not pro-Nazis or pro-Germans and so forth, and some Jews, of course, too, many communists. Only in, the, in 44, late 44, when Auschwitz was evacuated, and my father and I were among those who were evacuated, and we came to Buchenwald, that's when the little camp was created, which became a death camp. So I came back actually some 15 years ago there because there was a film that some people made. Mm -hmm. And we went there. And I asked the director, where is the little camp? He said, well, you cannot see it anymore. Because, because, and because, nothing. And he showed me actually trees, a lot of trees. He said, that's where the little camp was. And I was so upset that actually I left right away. Now we came back. The same director was there, he said, you see, your anger there helped me. Now we have already something at least. So, of course, I came there with the president, and, uh, in the, but you mentioned the speech. I was not supposed to speak. Was that extemporaneous? Absolutely. Not only that, in the printed program, only uh, Chancellor Merkel and President Obama were to speak. And literally, as he was about to go on st to start speaking, he turned to me and said, Ellie, I think here, you should have the last word. It was done with such gentleness, with such sensitivity, that I was taken away. I, said, I, I was not prepared for it. So it's true, I saw my father naturally. But then I see my father everywhere. Let me skip for, for years and years and years backward or forward. When I got the Nobel Prize, the ceremony and the, the chairman of the jury of the committee spoke and spoke and spoke and then at the end he said your darkest moment was when your father died you were there with him this is now the most luminous moment and your son is with you and therefore he asked for my son to come up on stage to be with me and because of the shortcut I couldn't speak because I saw my father. I couldn't speak. It took me a long, long, long moment for me to start speaking. So again, the same kind of moment was with me by the president there in Buchenwald. I didn't know that. What was your father's name? Shlomo. Shlomo. Before the war, what was he like? Who was Shlomo? My father, you know, I was the only son, we had three sisters, the only son, we lived in Sigurd. My father had actually a store, a grocery store, but he was rarely there. My mother was there, some of my sisters. Her name? He, my mother, Sarah. Sarah. And uh, my father was such a, 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 a community activist. His, his uh, assignment was to save Jews from prison because many Jews came from Poland through, illegally to the border and were imprisoned, sent back. And my father had actually to find ways of keeping them in prison, in Sigurd, not to be sent back to Poland. At one point he discovered a method. He heard that anyone who is found with foreign currency is being sent to Budapest for interrogation. So he somehow obtained a few dollars and a few sterlings and Swiss francs and the moment he came to jail to visit those prisoners, he gave every one of them money, and he saved a few hundred Jews, until one of them somehow was arrested and gave names. My father was arrested 
was sent to, to Budapest, tortured, but he never spoke about it. He did not tell you about it, wouldn't speak no, to you about no. it? But How know, old were you? You were young at that time. At that time, I was 14, 15. I was in, in, when I came to, to Auschwitz, I was 15 and a half. Mm -hmm. May I read what you wrote, what you spoke? Please go ahead. The day he, my father, your father, died, it was one of the darkest days of my life. He became sick, weak, and I was there. I was there when he suffered. I was there when he asked for help, for water. I was there to receive his last words. But I was not there when he called for me. Although we were in the same block, he on the upper bed and I on the lower bed, he called my name and I was too afraid to move. All of us were. And then he died. I was there, but I was not there. And that just came out of you. You had not prepared those remarks. Of course not. But something at that moment brought all of this back to you. And I guess I'm asking you, you know, in a moment I want to talk to you about Mad Desire to Dance. And I read the book before I read this part of your speech. And you know, Ellie, when somebody reads another person's novel, you don't ever know whether you're getting what the novelist really wanted the reader to get. And in some way, a great novel allows the reader to bring any perspective the reader has to the book. But I felt that there was a theme in this book that was so strikingly reflected in the remarks you made and that your main character, and I am getting into the book, your main character, Doriel, Doriel Waldman, who in your book is roughly 60 years old, had never been in a concentration camp but was certainly a survivor had lived through the Holocaust. And in the book, this marvelous book, which I hope everybody brings into their home, and you know, just to digress one more moment, throughout all of my teachings, I always say to people, you can't have a Jewish home without night being in the home and without messengers of God, because you know how much I love that book. And then all your novels, you've written 50 books all of them should be in a Jewish person's home. But as much as I've loved night, as much as I've loved messages of God, there's something about this that is so touchingly Ellie Wiesel in every insight. And the, the book is about, and I don't want to give it, everything away, but it's about a man on the edge, in my mind, on the edge of madness, searching to a relationship he develops with a very special psychiatrist, Teresa Goldschmidt, who herself is the child of survivors, is trying to find out where the madness is, and it seems to me is desperately trying not to go mad. And there are many questions raised in the book, but in the end, the doctor who keeps pushing ultimately says, in effect, as I read the book, if there's madness, if you're at the edge of madness, it comes from your feelings of guilt that you weren't there when your parents died. And at one point near the very end of the book, there's this line of guilt because the survivor outlived his parents and his siblings. In the book, the siblings all die, have died already. And then I read this passage that you extemporaneously spoke at Bogenwald, and I'm saying to myself, is there a connection here? And I only have a right to presume so much on our friendship, so it's only to the extent to which you're comfortable speaking about it. To what extent is there, a th is there this theme that you're addressing, that you're investigating, that you're opening uh, up for us who we're, we did not experience the night and you take us into something, some part of the mind and soul of those who survived the night and show us something about the nightmare they live with now. The night is over, the nightmare is not over. 
And so I'm asking you, to what extent am I right that there's some kind of connection between the two? Usually, in the work and the life of an author, everything is connected. There is a connection, of course. There must be. One brings the other. One completes the other. One explains the other. It's always. Although the characters are different, the teams are different, but they are connected. Am I there? Yes, of course, I wrote him. But I'm not there, because all this is fiction. Absolute fiction, except for night and the two memoirs. Everything is fiction. But nevertheless, because of the fiction itself, who imagined those characters? Who imagined those stories? So, of course, I imagined those stories. Because I lived them, no, because I imagined them. Why did I, did I imagine those stories and not others? Maybe it has to do with something else, totally else, mystically, mystically transmitted. But one thing is I want you to know. I write these novels, not that you should know me better, mm -hmm. but I want you to know yourself better. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is the goal. You, write, you read me and you know you, who you are, better because of that. The team is madness for all kinds of reasons. First, because at home we had a madhouse. My father would go every Shabbat afternoon to visit prisoners, Jewish prisoners. My mother and his sister went to the hospital. I was sent to bring candy and fruit to madmen. So I actually was always obsessed with that. What do they see? What does a madman see of the world that he or she is in? And nobody can see. A psychiatrist, therefore, can actually not cure madness because a psychiatrist is not mad, cannot see what his or her patient sees. At the same time, I was in France and studied philosophy. I also studied psychopathology. And for a year or two, actually, I used to go twice or three times a year to a hospital just to, to, to deliver the courses, to follow courses. And therefore, here I came to madness because mystical madness, historical madness, some history is traversed by convulsions that are the convulsions of madness. What we lived through in my lifetime was history's madness. So I tried to understand it, of course. How was it? Was it possible? How was it possible, really, that the world should accept, should allow, condone, such madness that caused six million Jewish men, women, and children. As for guilt, I don't believe in survivor's guilt. Many psychiatrists do. I don't. Because we haven't done anything to survive. I haven't done anything to survive. I was always weak, always from home. As a child, I was a weakling. My parents would take me to, to doctors all the time. I, I discovered big cities to the doctors. We didn't have enough, we, although we had Jewish, Jewish physicians in my town. Something which is extraordinary, by the way. As a child, beginning age seven, I developed migraine headaches, terrible migraine headaches. My grandfather had migraines, my mother had migraines, my father had migraines, and normally, of course, I also had migraines, hereditary migraines. The day I entered Auschwitz, they stopped. The day I came to an orphanage in France, they came back. And I gave a lot of commencement addresses to medical schools. I asked them, explain to me. No one has explanation. So maybe that's why I have here the but guilt. I don't feel guilty. I feel terrible sadness. I'm sad that I couldn't couldn't, couldn't get up because there were, there were the Germans, there were the couples and so forth, and we were not allowed to move out of my... that I couldn't get up and say that I'm with you. But he knew I was there. I was there, actually, there, in the same bed, in the same box, as we called it. But nevertheless, the sadness is when he called my name, and I couldn't be there. But not killed. So you and I have spoken a couple of times about the survivor's drive to bring another generation into the world and how the survivor has the right, it would seem, to say, I'm not going to. And at one point 
in your book, Doriel gives an eloquent speech to the psychiatrist about why he's never married and why he's never chosen to, to have children. <coughs> and in some way, it's almost in his answer to God after the Holocaust, as you write. And uh, it evoked in me, again, I, I understand what you're saying, but you and I have talked about this before. I should mention to all of our viewers that this book is dedicated to your two grandchildren, Elijah and Shira. Shira. So lucky you. You had a gorgeous son, and now you have two wonderful grandchildren. You made a decision in your life. You made a decision to have children. And in the book, and I don't feel this is giving anything away because it, it, the, the end is so romantic. Do you consider yourself a romantic, Ellie Wiesel? Of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a romantic book. It's so wonderful. Anyway, at the end, Doriel falls in love with a younger woman who says to him, it doesn't matter that you're older. And he says, it matters to the body. The body knows. And she says, the body is wrong. <laughs> oh, you are romantic. Absolutely. <laughs> Literally. And then they have children. They, they, ultimately, at the end, she's going to have a child. And in the end, it leads to the, the title of the book. I'll leave that now for the reader to find himself. But I want you to speak again to me about how some survivors don't want to have children, and you represent those who do, and your character goes, has this arc, where at the beginning, for, you know, for virtually 60 years of his life, this character is tormented, and has decided not to have, bring children into the world, and then does. And I'm not asking now about Doriel, I'm not asking about Doriel Waldman, I'm asking in your experience, in all your travels, you who have known more about what it is to be a survivor than anyone, what have you learned and what can you tell us? Mark, it's not really that, that simple because the will to live and to survive in the Jewish people had to do with history, with collective memory. The idea that we cannot allow the enemy to destroy our people, our history, our memory, it worked sometimes wonders, but at the same time, of course, it brought much pain. In the ghettos, in the ghettos, they got married. In the ghettos, they had children. In the ghettos, one day or one week before being deported to Auschwitz, they still had circumcisions for their children. Now, after the war, the first thing, when they were liberated, and they went to DP camps in, in Germany. I didn't. I went to France, to an orphanage, to Ose. But the, the, literally, you have marriages, marriages, a lot of weddings in the DP camps. But you might ask, why did they do that? They just lost their families. And now they marry again without any, any anguish, saying, how can we do that? How can we risk another life and face more, more, more challenges, more dangers? We live in a dangerous world, in DP camps. So therefore, it's not so. Most survivors actually did have children because they believed, again, they believed we cannot stop. That goes, by the way, for religion too. When people say, I, I cannot stop, I don't want my to be the last of a, of, of a line. My father, late film, I have to wear it. My grandfather, my great-grandfather, I come from Russia, I'm a descendant of Russia. So how can I do that? And therefore, it's not simple. The, the, the desire to say to the enemy, no, you are not going to destroy us. But on the other hand, you are a rabbi. Remember the Talmudic saying that in Talmudic times, during, this is a Talmud, when there is a catastrophe befalling on the Jewish people. Human catastrophe or natural catastrophe. People, there was a, there was a, the Proshim, the Pharisees who decided not to get married, not to have children. The reason being, I cannot go against God's will. If God wants to have a world without children, we cannot have children. 
there I disagree. And I say, even if God doesn't want us to have children, we will have children. Even if God, Kapiacholas, will say, doesn't want me to believe in him, I will believe in him. And what about the difficulty some survivors have in telling the story, which is another theme in this book? Ultimately, the psychiatrist, Teresa Goldschmidt, gets Dorian to talk. You have always talked. No. You have not always talked. No, I waited 10 years. I, before writing Night, or I wrote it in Yiddish, called Und die Welt hat geschwiegen, the, the world was silent. I waited 10 years. I wanted 10 years. I could have said 20 or 10. I, I just came out with 10, knowing that one day I will have to bear witness. And I wanted to be sure that the words will be the proper words, the right words. So no, it wasn't easy. Not, not at all. And in truth, it, it, there were a few things. Number one, the moment the survivor would come either home or to Palestine or to America, most survivors wanted to tell the story. And people say, don't. Turn the page. You suffered enough. You are in a new place, a new age, a new conditions, new situation. It's enough. Don't do it anymore. It's enough. They didn't want to hear it. Interesting. Then nevertheless, here and there, a few books came out. And actually, most of them would say, anyway, you won't understand. You won't understand. Why talk? You won't understand. So there were a few, a few phases in, in, in the entire process of transmission. I felt it. And therefore, I have written, as you say, 50 books, but only three or four deal with that subject. Correct. Because again, first, I don't want to make it into a routine. But to me, it's a sacred mission. And therefore, it's a kind of sacred language. And uh, before, before saying a word like, like, like the Holocaust or Shoah or my father, I have to, to, to stop. If I don't, I betray myself. And if I don't feel that, that, that fear, that trembling, before or during, I wouldn't do what I'm doing. But nevertheless, let's like to say, and yet, we must do. Then why now a mere desire to dance? Oh, that coming oh, really, that's really, it's, it's my, I think, the 49th or 50th book, my 50th just came out in Paris, it's because I tried to, to tackle all the possible themes that somehow face my contemporaries. So I checked everything. In, in, in Dawn, I described about political like, violence and action. In the, in, in the day, I, I, I tackled suicide. In, in Town Beyond the Wall, friendship. In the gates of the forest, I, I, I tackle faith. In, in Jerusalem, the, the beggar in Jerusalem is Jerusalem. So always I tackle something else. And here, finally, the time had come to tackle the theme of madness. Not dancing. I have never danced in my life. <laughs> I don't know how to dance. The only time I dance is Simchat Torah, with the Torah. But not dancing. I've never went to a club. Or, I don't know how to do that. So therefore, it's only because of the, it ends the book. Mm -hmm. It gives a meaning and a direction mm -hmm. to the novel. That's why I could be called it like that. Mm -hmm. Come now back to your time at Buchenwald with the president. You know, right away, I sing, I'm saying to myself, you and I spoke about another president who was going to go to Bitburg, President Reagan, and how you asked him not to go because it was, in essence, in, one, in some way, honoring the SS in some tangential way. He, he didn't way. mean it. But I know he didn't. Of course not. Um, and you t you've also described with, to me how upset he became when he realized he, how it could be in, misinterpreted. So you well, were... Uh, he's, really, he, he said to me, he said, I don't want to go, but my people make me go. And we know who that was. The, main, the, worst, the worst one, really, then, was uh, Pat Buchanan. He's the one who really pressed the president to go there. Mm -hmm. It was almost against the president's will. So how do you learn that you were going to accompany President Obama to Buchenwald? 
I know, t I, I've met the president twice, actually. Once I met him, but he was still a senator. So I said, you saw him, my wife and I saw him in the Senate. Then I saw him, you know, we have every year the remembrance ceremony in Washington for the Holocaust Memorial Council, which I, I actually initiated some 30 years ago. And uh, we met again. And then I heard that uh, read somewhere that he was going to Buchenwald, and I spoke to a friend in the White House. And he began, he began saying, you know, you were there, maybe. That's how it came. And then okay. he called me up and saying, please, he wants you to be his, to, you want his guide. And therefore, uh, I, I went. Also, you've heard that the speech that the president gave in Cairo has evoked so much both positive and negative reaction within the Jewish community. And some of the negative reaction is that the president referred to the suffering of the Jewish people during the Holocaust and then spoke about the suffering of the Palestinians who have not been able to have a state of their own, a country of their own for the last 60 years since 1947-48. And then there was the issue of the president seeming to say that his understanding of the Jewish claim to a Jewish homeland in Eretz Yisrael was because of the Holocaust. I want you to take those two issues separately and just to what extent did they resonate to you? Again, do you, to what extent do you feel that they are overblown? First of all, do you feel there was, the president made a mistake in any way by drawing a comparison between Jewish suffering in the Holocaust and the Palestinian suffering? If, it's meant, if it was meant to be there, it was a mistake. I don't think it was meant to be there. Was, I, I didn't hear the speech. I was on the plane going to Europe. But I read it and there was one. And I had a discussion then. There was one thing which I felt was wrong. It's a mistake. He's, what you said, first he speaks about the Holocaust, movingly, by the way. For him, it's an important issue. He's very, very sensitive to, to Jewish suffering because of the Holocaust. And then he said, on the other hand, and that was wrong, the, on the other hand, could actually give credence to those who believe it's equivalence. But had he said, but, just, just that, not on the other hand, but, but, they are also, it wouldn't have been there. But, but, let me tell you but now. But I heard then on the plane, I said, that he was giving an interview next day, or the same day maybe, to, uh, with Tom Brocco, and there he corrected it. So the President of the United States corrected, because he realized it's through these words, this expression was, uh, had, to be, it had to be corrected. A speech is not perfect for me, because I am Jewish totally Jewish. But of course, I'm totally linked to, 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 to the state of Israel, the Jewish state. And I, 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 I have such profound attachment to Israel. Of course, that I'm not objective. The president can be objective. After all, it's his right to be objective. And say that he cannot forget that the Palestinians also suffer. I, can also, I can't forget either that they suffer. I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't be the person I am. I believe that the Jew in me, the more Jewish I am, the more universal my message. And I've tried in my adult life, wherever, wherever there were injustices, I tried to be on the side of the victims, always. With the dissidents, in, not only the Jews in Russia, the dissidents in Russia, and then Cam Cambodia, and the, the Bosnia. President Clinton said on television, in my presence, he said once, uh, that direct like he said, you want to know who changed America's policy in Bosnia, it was Eri Wiesel. Because I spoke up during the opening of the, of the museum and we, then we remained, as a result, very close friends. And I helped him on that and, and we managed to do that. So therefore, look, the presidency is the commander-in-chief. Is he an enemy of Israel? I am ready to swear that he is not. He is not. I think he's a decent man. I think he really wants to do what every single president since 1948 wanted to do. And he hoped that he would achieve to, to, uh, to, 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 to bring peace between Israel and, and, and the Arabs. Does he know enough? Maybe if people would were to explain to him the history, then they would uh, manage and succeed in, in, in giving, uh, let's say if he goes to Israel, he will give a different speech maybe. There it was, it was directed to the Muslim world. If I had written the speech, I thought it wouldn't be the same speech, naturally. 
but I must say I, I think the man is not an enemy of Israel. I think that he, this man wants what is good for Israel and what is also good for, 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 for Muslims. Why not? For, I would like him to be peace all over the world, not only to, between, between two nations. What about the reference as if the reason the Jewish people have a claim to Eretz Yisrael is because of the Holocaust? I think it's wrong. It's wrong. I go very far in, in, in that respect. I even, some people believe, some, some, I heard it myself saying that uh, had there been no Holocaust, there would be no Israel, which is chronologically true, but not metaphysically. And I have written about it, and I say it, and I repeat it with you now. I don't want to believe that the Israel is the result or the reward for, it was a terrible thing to say, the reward for the Holocaust. We are a 3,500 year old people. And we, we, we had a state there. And we lived in it. And every day, if you are religious, you say prayers for that state. We ask for prayers in Israel because we believe that Israel is the center of Jewish history, no matter what. So therefore, of course, it's not. I, I really believe, chronologically, yes, it came after, but not Historically, not metaphysically, but not theologically, surely not. We are there because we always have been, always been there. There was never a period without Jews in Palestine. There are some who feel that even-handedness does not have to mean moral equivalency. And that even-handedness has to do with how America now, in its foreign policy, addresses the Jewish state of Israel and the Palestinian desire to express themselves in some kind of nation state as well. And that to the best of the administration's, to the best of their ability, they now should try to facilitate some kind of coming together if a coming together is possible. But that that does not mean there is an equivalency of the past, an equivalency of moral responsibility for the lack of peace today or an equivalency even in historical claim to the land. Look, and I, the, I agree with all that. I said the same thing. Surely not. But and my is. question for you is, do you sense, not necessarily President Obama, but there's administration, there's a whole group of people here who now create American foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East. Is it your sense that the people who are now guiding the president and the president's own instincts are such that he understands the distinction you and I are making between even-handedness and not trying to make that a moral equivalency of the past. I am against moral equivalency. <laughs> and I, as a Jew, the Jew that I am, I am not for even-handedness. <laughs> I am not. The president, the president is not Jewish. And furthermore, look, give him a chance. He is young in the administration. He's five months in, the, in, in, in his office. He will learn. If it, will, he, will he say the same thing that I am saying? Uh, of course not. He doesn't have my experience. He doesn't leave. He didn't study the Talmud that you and I are studying. Of course not. But I, I, I don't think that he wants to hurt Israel. I do not think that. At Buchenwald, when you spoke, you tried to make a distinction about I'm going to use now simplistic words, optimism and hope vis-a-vis -vis pessimism and despair, and extemporaneously a line from Camus came into your mind, which, was, which is, and again, people who know Camus often think that he was only negative, and you found a very positive line from Camus. And you tried to express your own feeling about how hopeful or unhopeful a person should be at this time in modern history. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking you, Ali Wiesel, today as you sit with me, how hopeful are you about a peaceful future for this world? Because you and I have spoken at other times, and I've heard what you've said before. I want to know what you're thinking. Now as we meet together, where are, where are you? Well, to tell you that I'm very hopeful, it's not true. No because there are too many, too many negatives. Anti-Semitism is rising. Racism is still there in many, many parts. 
And then somehow, I must tell you, I was fighting Ahmadinejad for the last two years at least, all over the world. I, I, I really believe this man should not be president. I think that he should be arrested. Arrested and brought to Hague before international court, charged with intentions of, with, with incitement of crimes against humanity. Why does he say? He said the Holocaust never happened, but he will make a Holocaust and he wants to destroy Israel. So I also believe, by the way, that his adversary, uh, Musavi, would not be better than he is. But one thing I also know, that hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of young men and women openly, openly came out to demonstrate for freedom, for liberty, for equality, for democracy, when he has all the power in the world to suppress them and to kill them. He has all the secret services, all the security services, the army, the police, the revolutionary guards, and they come and they show their face, women with their open face, showing what they want, a free country, and the world is silent. That bothers me. And I, that hurts me that somehow this civilized world is not coming to tell them, look, we cannot come and fight for you, for all kinds of reasons. We cannot. But one thing at least you should know, we are with you. We are with you. We are in our prayers, in our thoughts, in aspirations. We do want you to know you are not alone. So therefore, what, what hope can we give to those people, let's say in Iran, who want now to be free and are not? At the same time, I also believe that what Camus says, ultimately, he said, at the end of, 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 his, of, of his novel, ultimately, there is more in the human being to celebrate than to denigrate. I believe in that. And very Jewish. Yeah, very Jewish, of course. This is Jewish. You mentioned earlier that when your father was taken to Budapest, he was tortured. You know, in America, suddenly, there was this big debate over the appropriateness of torturing one's prisoners. And waterboarding, whether it's torture or not, most people think it is, was an example, just an example. And the question was raised, even in the Jewish community, to what extent would Jews in some way give a stamp of, of imprimatur to the torturing of, let's say, terrorists who knew that a bomb was placed on an egghead bus and they wanted to know the answer. So it's very important to me to be able to ask this question of Elie Wiesel. I am against torture. For years and years and years, I belonged to all kinds of international committees against torture. Because a tortured person dies more than once. And the tortured person remains tortured, just as a raped woman remains raped for the rest of her life. A tortured person remains tortured. But I know the other, the other side, which you just said. I, I, because in Israel, in Israel now, thank God, there was a commission, and they came out with, with laws about torture. Israel stopped torture, but they did in the past. And I, I said then, I remember to Golda Meir, she was prime minister, I said to her, look, I, I cannot accept it. She said, you don't live in Israel. It's true, but I'm a Jew. I said, Jew, I cannot accept that. And then the general asked me, what about the bus? The t they call it the ticking bomb. But I said, first, I'm not a general, therefore, you, I, I'm giving you the question, but you give me, you have to find the answers. Second, I, I don't know what I would do. But I want one thing. There are other ways. I know today you have some pentotal truth serums and so forth. You can do it with, with, with with chemical literature to make the person talk and, and not to have torture. But in Israel now they stop. They do not torture, by the way. Torture. That's correct. They don't torture. They do not. No. Yes. So you're against torture even in the case of the ticking bomb? I don't know. I said, no, I, you I, know said I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't torture. I don't say no, no. I cannot go that far. No, but you would not want it to be I would a not. societal policy. I don't think it should be. I think, look, that's so even, let's say, a ticking bomb, because after all, this is the, I cannot hear myself say, let people, thousand people die because of my principle against torture. I, I cannot say that. 
But whatever the decision, I think, the decision such as this is to be made, it, it, it cannot be made immediately, in an instant. I think there should be a, a commission for each case, always a kind of ad hoc commission, including a moralist, not only a military and the, and the doctor and so forth. Somehow, let's not make it a routine. It's a, it's a terrible thing. I think it's so important that you stand up for this because I would like to believe, especially for a democracy that believes in freedom, sometimes you have to give up means of being barbaric, even if you pay a price. It's what, it's what really we're committed to, isn't it? As a Jew, I don't, I don't remember in our tradition, in our moral tradition, our religious tradition, torture. In the Talmud we have been not find torture. In the Bible we don't find torture. We don't find torture. So my last question for you is, as we sit together now, you recently came back from Prague. You were there for a, an international conference. European nations were there, other nations were there. Addressing the needs of the Holocaust survivors who are still alive, many of whom are in poor, horrible conditions and you spoke passionately about what you feel the world needs to do now for the Holocaust survivors who need help. May I ask you to again just sort of summarize for us what you think we should understand? There are Holocaust survivors and every one of them has his or her own memory, a story, a right to live and to speak and to bear witness and cannot be replaced. No one will ever replace a Holocaust survivor with his or her past. And therefore, if they need help, who are we to deny them that help? Really, what right do we have? Where is our heart? Where is our conscience? Where is our morality to deny them? So of course I spoke that that should be the priority of all priorities, is to help those survivors. And then, you know, there were a lot speaking about the banks and about all of these, the billions. And, my, my approach to it was, look, unfortunately, in those times, the enemy, not only did the enemy rob the riches of the rich, but the poverty of the poor. Yes. So we have to end. And I'm going to end with one little piece more from A Mad Desire to Dance by Elie Wiesel, which I hope people make sure they have in their home. A wonderful, wonderful book. And we've already talked how much it is an autobiographical, how at the same time it it's, comes out of who you are. So there's one powerful, wonderful, I get chills thinking of it here, description by Dorian of his Shabbat and how it was a transcending moment for him. And for all the pain of memory and remembering his parents, and again, there's a lot of that in this book, and his two siblings who died. At one point, there's a long description of how Shabbat was this marvelous moment in time. And you have phrases about the Shabbat in this book, which even if they're not autobiographical, doesn't matter. You're teaching us again what Shabbat is from behind your eyes. So end by this, end this way. I want to hear, at the most special time for you, as you were young with your family, before any of the night descended upon you, what was Shabbat for Elie Wiesel's family? It was an act of generosity. First of all, God's, and then our own. Shabbat is not only to bring the family together around the table, accompanied by two angels, but also a stranger. There was always some stranger whom we found in the synagogue or in the street. And I don't remember really a holiday or a Shabbat at home without a stranger. The stranger, too, deserved our generosity. Was there a song? Of course. Does the song still, the, do the song still flow in your mind? Naturally, sure, sure, of course. Do you miss it today? And how? 
<laughs> of course I miss it. I wrote about it and I repeat it actually. We have rebuilt many, many things after the war. One thing we have not rebuilt is the Shabbat in that little shtetl. Because in that little shtetl, Shabbat was a piece of Jerusalem. Today we have Jerusalem. It was nostalgia. What do you mean? It said the Shabbat afternoon, Shalosh Seudot, the third meal, the mystical meal, and I was feeling so sad but all of a sudden because the Sabbath was going, it was leaving us. And there was a marvelous, marvelous Jewish song that the grandmother would say, uh, God von Avron, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, Jai and, and Jacob, uh, don't light the candles yet, the have the light candles. Don't say the prayer at the end of the Shabbat. Let's, another day, another, another hour, another, another minute. Oh, you know how much I love talking to you, being in your presence, reading you, just knowing you're okay. And well. It has been a gift, you have given a gift of mind and heart, of action, in the highest form of the Jewish tradition. And I've said many things about you already, you know, that you're the rabbi of this generation that transcends. You've taught us so much, not only about the Shoah, but what it is to be a Jew and a mensch after the night. And in many ways, you are the modern prophet, and I don't mean to embarrass you. Now, I know, I know, I know. But what I mean by that is, you are constantly reminding us of our obligation, of our responsibility, a Jewish word, our responsibility to be as caring for other people as your parents were before the night. And everything you've done, every single thing you've done, Elie Wiesel, has been a reflection of where you, were, you came from and your mother and father. And every act you do is an act in their name that in some way continues to give this generosity you talk about, the generosity of your time, You've never once said no to me, but I know you don't say no, you don't say no to anybody. It's not, it's not. You taught me that the answer to a friend is of course. And you have made me always feel very, very special and very loved and very cared for. And I know that that's the gift you give to so many people. And I don't know how you don't become exhausted. I am. <laughs> but I want you to know that there would be people around you all the time who will at any time you need try to give back to you because we are so grateful. The book is, is, is a gift. Everything you stand for is a gift. Every time you speak is a gift. I wish you called Tuva Hatzlacha, continued strength. And if there's anything any of us can ever do to make it easier for you, we will be there for you. Do you understand? Absolutely. I love you very, very much. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very, very much. And those were the thoughts of Elie Wiesel, we hope you enjoyed meeting him for the first time or having the chance to hear him once again. Of course, as always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments to the ideas expressed by Elie Wiesel. Please email me or write me this week. And if you'd like to be in touch with Elie Wiesel, you can do so by sending your thoughts to me and I'll pass them on to him. And so until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who can send a tax-deductible contribution of $36 or more to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media to help support our programming. Tax-deductible checks may be made out to GEM and mailed to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. Please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. And we thank you for your kind support.